what do you do with money if it's so red hot? Well, um, <laughs> that is the question of the moment. It's a perennial question. I think there's really no substitute for having an investing team with broad experience and deep thematic expertise. You, you really got to understand the industries and the forward dynamics. Uh, you can't just model up the capital structure on a spreadsheet. Well, there's something else you're doing, Marty, over at Sixth Street that Warren Buffett said he wasn't going to do, which was take quantitative investing over to, to investing, right? So how do you see the opportunity to pivot all that you did at Goldman with technology over to Sixth Street? Well, the, the core of what I know how to do is to build models of the world. And so that's what we did in the training business. And that's what we're going to do in the private capital investing business, uh, building deep models of companies and sectors and looking at all the things that might go well and might not go so well. And quantitative, I'm just a quantitative and, and numbers person. Uh, but you also have to understand the themes and you also have to understand the game theory and all of the subjective dynamics. And so it's uh, maybe not so different from Warren's approach after all. In terms of, Marty, are there sectors that it works better for? I, I can see how it works for trading. And, and you obviously excelled at that and took that, took that whole business forward. But are there sectors when you come into private markets and are trying to model, as you say, companies and sectors that work better in terms of that approach? Well, there's certainly some sectors where it's more readily apparent how you want to build in a quantitative approach. So, for instance, in businesses that have a clear interest rate dependency or credit spread sensitivity, or the classic example, the, the business I grew up in, uh, the commodities business. There's the oil price, the gas price, the spark spreads. So in many cases, you'd want to start there. But I would submit that a quantitative numbers-based approach works everywhere. It's just much, much harder to do the more idiosyncratic the uh, situation. Marty, you know, this whole idea of quantitative investing moving away from the banks and the investment industry, you know, there's also a talent story here. A lot of folks like you have been moving over to the buy side. We're seeing at increasingly higher levels. What is it about the buy side that's been more enticing and how many more people do you think will start to move over in the next year or so? Well, I think the, the move from the sell side to the buy side is in many respects as old as the hills. I, <laughs> I remember talking about it and thinking about it 30 years ago and we're talking about it now. I think there's a, there's a natural flow back and forth and uh, I, don't, I don't really see it as a wholesale move. And also, I think the, the idea of a dichotomy between the sell side and the buy side, that's an idea that's been powerful for a long time. I'm not sure that it's the most interesting way uh, to think about the, the financial system. I think there are new dichotomies that are arising Right. Are you a producer of an API? Are you a consumer of an API? Are you inside a particular regulatory construct or outside a particular regulatory construct? I think those are much more interesting ways to well, understand evolution. Well, let's talk about that regulatory construct because we have this huge growth in private capital. Sixth Street alone, $20 billion in growth in assets in, since the beginning of last year. How much more do you think that this industry has room to grow? And is there too much capital chasing too few deals? I am an optimist. I think that there is plenty of capital and there are plenty of opportunities. I think we stand at the, the, the uh, very beginning of huge uh, evolutions and opportunity that don't happen every day that are not business as usual. And I think when you look at most of these opportunities, what you'll see is that it's the intersection of software and something else. So I've been working at the intersection of software and finance for about a quarter century. And one of the things that I trained for and was super excited about, uh, went to grad school for, was the intersection of software and life sciences. I had a professor who told me in 1981, the future of life sciences is computational. 
he was absolutely right. He was also early. The compute power wasn't great enough to do the things that we wanted to do, but the compute power has finally caught up. And I think you are going to just see a continuing explosion of opportunities, particularly yeah. at the intersection of healthcare and life sciences, mm -hmm. as well as software. So, Marty, one of the things that's also changing that sector in a pretty radical way is the pandemic. How, how does the pandemic and the acceleration we've seen in the industry as a result of what is happening and continues to happen worldwide, plus that, that computing power that you talk about, how do these two things come together? They come together in so many ways. I'll just give you a couple couple of ideas. So one, I, I, I get chills every time I think mm -hmm. about this, but I am a, I am a science geek. Uh, so the Moderna vaccine, the first candidate for the Moderna vaccine was synthesized and ready to go before a single particle of the virus had ever been isolated in the United States. It was pure software. Scientists in China uploaded the DNA sequence and then scientists at Moderna downloaded it and just in software, they programmed up the vaccine candidate. So that is one example. Another example is during the pandemic when it was very difficult to be in offices and in labs. And this is something we all saw. There was this mass acceleration in can we do things in a purely digital way? Can we do a pathology lab workflow in a purely digital way? And the answer is we can. And so the pandemic accelerated many of those things that were already happening and brought them to the forefront. You're going to see a continuation of that. Marty, speaking about software and finance, totally worth asking you today about cryptocurrencies, given the uptick we're seeing in Ethereum and, and everything that's non-Bitcoin. Uh, you know, where do you see the future of this going? Are you, are you worried about these investors at all? Or do you think that there are just a lot of people that are not understanding this market uh, that should be playing in it at a greater rate? Well, so many, so many questions to unpack there. First of all, I, as you know, for many years, I, I've, uh, I've stayed uh, away from making any kinds of predictions about what the future price of anything is going to be. When I was growing up in the oil markets, people always asked me, hey, what do you think about the price of WTI? And I would say, uh, somewhat infamously, there's a 50% chance it goes up and a 50% <laughs> chance it goes down. And but you're right. if you're concerned about that, we can you, we can transfer that risk from from you to us. So that is always a possibility. I would say the same thing about digital assets. Uh, the price could go up, the price could go down. People who are buying these assets really need to think of them as commodities. They are not currencies. In my view, the word cryptocurrency is a, is a misnomer. They're commodities, and just like any other commodity, the price can go to the moon, and it can go to zero. And as we saw with WTI, uh, futures contracts uh, front month in the, short, in the pandemic, they can actually, those ones can go negative. Uh, uh, cryptocurrencies mm -hmm. can. But one thing that you will absolutely see and, and this is the one prediction that I'm confident to make. And it's either trivial or profound. And it is, in the future, there will be more software than there is today. And that software will be applied to everything, right? This is, this is Mark Andreessen's software eating the world. And so if you look at actual currencies, there is no question in my mind that the dollar, for instance, will continue the digital journey, which, by the way, it has been on for 50 years. And most dollars exist in the form of central bank currency in mm -hmm. master accounts with the Federal Reserve, the Fed funds accounts. And then the rest of them are those paper bills that we see and use, most of which are actually outside of the United States. So those paper bills, no question in my mind, are going to eventually disappear and be replaced with digital tokens. Well, Marty, all the stuff that you've been talking about all has to center around technology. And so I wonder how you look at the whole sector in terms of antitrust. Like, yes, it's focused on the big guys right now, like an Apple, for example, in the Epic case that's coming up today in California, but it's also Amazon, it's Facebook, and it could trickle down. How do you look at that? Well, I, uh, I wrote, a, wrote an op-ed for The Economist a few weeks ago that lays out the way I'm thinking about it. Uh, to my mind, antitrust isn't really the way I would think about uh, big tech. I'm thinking about it much more in terms of what were the rules 
the laws and rules that were applied to the financial system over time. There was a huge wave of regulation back in the 30s after the stock market crisis. Again, another wave with Dodd-Frank after the Great Recession. And if you look at what the regulators have done in the area of financial services, well, here's one thing that outcome that it, it is not, was not an accident. During the pandemic, there was so much disruption to so many sectors. The one sector that we might have been really worried about but didn't worry about was the banking sector. Banks continued to lend. They continued to make markets. And a lot of that had to do with the huge upgrade in systemic safety and stability and risk management of Dodd-Frank. More capital, more liquidity, more internal models. All of that can be applied to big tech. I would be talking about and am talking about something in the form of a carbon tax for polluting the infosphere to do something about the loop of showing more posts that cause more emotional resonance outrage, more engagement, more time on site, more advertising revenues. There's really no limit to that cycle. We need to put some limits into that cycle. And then there are other areas of information barriers that have been around in financial services for a long time that we also need to see in big tech, separating logistics from merchandising, advertising engines from both sides of the advertising market. So I think there's a lot of important analogies there. Antitrust yep. breakup, uh, not sure. To my mind, I don't see how that makes anything better.